Thank you, John, and thanks everyone for attending this webinar. I hope you can see my screen. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to you uh, about a product that uh, is close to my heart, about the Nexium 5000 and its first multiple ICPMS and its application in the radionuclide uh, industry and radionuclide detection. Uh, if we talk about ICPMS, we cannot but stop uh, to mention Pekerelma and its uh, long history of innovation and coupling coupled to ICPMS from the very first uh, commercial ICPMS back in 1983 to a list of innovation that I'm showing here uh, on the screen and uh, expanding over uh, the years. I'm going to stop on a number of these that uh, it, they are amazing in the sense that we are still using them today and they are still an integral part of your instrumentation. Back in 1989, Pergamon innovated the first plasma lock technology. And this is a patented technology where the, the, the plasma is grounded so you minimize the arcing between the plasma and the interface and the mass spectrometer and therefore allowing you to see clean spectra and lower detection limits. In the 90s, the major issue with uh, ICPMS was uh, interference, spectroscopic interferences and uh, cell-based instrumentation started to appear. Empakilma launched the very first dynamic reaction cell. And that shows the history that we have with expertise in using reactions within ICPMS and targeting specific interferences and offering a great way of eliminating these interferences. Another point to stop on is in 2010, the, the launch of the triple cone interface, uh, coupled with the QID that allowed you know, the Nexian ICPMS to be the lowest maintenance instrument in the market when it compared to any other ICPMS out there because, and I'll be talking more about it, the design in there allowed us to control the unwanted material that is formed in the plasma and preventing it from depositing on the lenses inside the mass spectrometer and therefore minimizing the need to open the mass spectrometer and, and clean those lenses. A, a reflection of the, inter, of the uh, investment that Pekerma is putting in 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 uh, in, uh, in ICPMS and the dedication of ICPMS is in 2017 where we designed the first 34 megahertz RF generator. It's an RF generator designed for ICPMS. Historically, there were two school of thoughts: should we go 27 or 40 megahertz? These were the two available RF generators to be used in analytical instrumentation such as ICP and ICPMS, and the debate this is better than that or this is better than that. Uh, we took the time to investigate and look at what are the various frequencies that we could use and which is the best. And uh, we designed our own and it's based on, actually it's one easy way to find that 34 is halfway between the 27 and the 40 megahertz, uh, where we coupled the benefit of both of them, uh, offering them into, onto the market. And I'm pleased to announce that this year, we've launched the very first uh, multi quadrupole ICPMS, the Nexium 5000, showing it in here. So what's the difference in here? What have we done that's different with the uh, multi quadrupole? So first thing that we notice in here is the presence of four quadrupole in the system. If we look at Q0, the uh, uh, very first uh, quadrupole, it's quadrupole ion deflectors. It's not a transmission quadrupole, it doesn't have the high resolution. Its role in here is to filter neutrals and photons. They go out but also focus specific mass range into the Q1. So again, minimizing the, the ion intensity going into the first quadrupole, making life for the mass spectrometer much easier. And again, it's integral part in here with the, you have no lenses, nothing to clean. Uh, after that comes the first, uh, first analyzing quadrupole that controls what ions enter into the reaction cell. We've had reaction cells for years, as I, as I mentioned earlier but now we're controlling what gets into the cell. So we have a cleaner reaction. We can control the reaction now. And then comes the differentiator, the big differentiator here between the X instrument and triple quads, and I'll, we'll be talking more detail about it, is the universal cell technology, the actual reaction cell itself that 
not now we're not only controlling what gets in the cell, we are controlling what happens in the cell. We control what comes out of the cell. And finally, the, the standard analyzing quadrupole that we see in all ICPMS instrumentation that allow us to do the final separation. So what does that offer us in oh, as an overall for, for here? We get improved accuracy because we've got an outstanding spectral interference removal to control the reaction. As I mentioned, we're not only controlling what gets into the cell, but we are also controlling what happens in the cell. Detection that that extra control allows, coupled with the number of innovation at the front end, allow us to reach subpart per trillion background equivalent concentrations, even for alkali, alkali earth element, these are abundant elements, and even in hot plasma. So, uh, you know, there are uh, means of getting, reducing the the, uh, the impurities and, and the signals from the impurities for the alkali, alkali earth by going to cold plasma and allowing you to get to uh, lower detection limit that way. But cold plasma has its own issues in terms of matrix tolerances and, and the like. Although you can do cool plasma with the with the Nexium 5000, you don't have to. You can get really low levels still in very hot plasma. Throughput, we have long-term stability even when running harsh matrices, and you can switch between more different modes of uh, extraction, different modes of uh, gases uh, gases in the cell to get the best of your uh, from your matrix from your, and to get best data for your samples. That ability you can do it in a very rapid manner to improve your throughput and also productivity. And this is also, you know, it's very important for especially for the radio nuclide industry where you don't want waste, you know, you don't want to be accessing the instrument to clean it. And, and, and that's the key thing in here. The design that I mentioned, the, the triple cone interface and the QID behind it help us to prevent maintenance in the vacuum uh, region because there's nothing that gets dirty. And that's uh, that's a big plus in that area. I'll go to in a bit more detail about these features and I'll, I'm going to take it by starting from the instrument, you know, from the outside inside. So I'm rather talking on the priority of to, to which what comes first. So start with the productivity side first. And, and when I'm talking about the lack of maintenance, why do we need uh, less maintenance beyond cones? If we look at the standard ICPMS in, in here, the standard ICPMS typically has two cones, all ICPMSs have that and on the second cone when you're talking here you're jumping into the high vacuum region so there's a big jump from the intermediate vacuum between the sampler and the skimmer and behind behind the skimmer that big drop in pressure that big jump in, into the vacuum means the beam diversions is going to be quite wide and if you have lenses behind this to uh, to to guide your ions all that Unwant, all these unwanted species that come from the plasma is going to be impinging onto these uh, lenses and they're going to affect these lenses and that means you're going to start clean them. What happens with the Nexian, what we launched 300, 2000 and the 5000 also, is that we've introduced a third cone. And here in the 300 and the 2000, this is a you know, grounded uh, hyperschema cone. So, the drop in pressure is smaller and the beam diversions is smaller. And then we have another drop in pressure after the, the third cone. Again, the, the beam diversion is smaller. So that means that the beam coming from the behind the third cone is quite narrow. This beam, as I say, contains the ions, but also contain neutrals and unwanted species. What happened after that is that we are subjecting this ion beam into a quadrupole ion deflector, as I, as I showed earlier and shown in here. It's the 90 degree angle in there. So the unwanted species, gone because they have no charge, they keep going straight and out into the vacuum, uh, into the vacuum pumps, while the ions of interest will turn around and you get them into the uh, mass spectrometer. So overall in here, nothing for the uh, neutral species and wanted species to, to fall on, and that gives us this extra productivity in terms of no maintenance behind the cones. But what we designed new with the Nexium 5000 compared to the grounded hyperschema cone that we had on the 200, uh, on the 2000 and the 300 series, 
is this new novel uh, hyperschema, which allowed us to gain the more sensitivity. So it's, it's part of its two, two section in there. You have the hyperschema, and you have a, a ring, an omni ring behind the, the hyperschema, and then you can apply different voltages. The idea here is to have a small positive voltage on the hyperschema. What does that do? Is basically it attracts the electron, prevent the electrons from escaping from the ion beam. Does that mean the ion beam remain neutral? Because what happens is when the, or the electrons escape from the ion beam, the ion beam becomes coming into the behind the schema becomes highly charged, positively charged, and you start seeing columbic repulsion between the various ions. So you're pushing the lighter ions out of the way in favor of the heavier ions. So you lose, you know, your mass response curve will be will dip at the low mass end. Well, here you can maintain that beam neutrality for longer, can maintain that and gain more sensitivity. And typically we gain uh, three to four times more sensitivity with this design. Mm -hmm. We move from there is the question finder. So we got the sensitivity. How are we achieving this accuracy? We talked about the role of, of uh, the multiquad and the role of the reaction cell, having a quad as a reaction cell, as opposed to a normal multiple that you will see in, in, a, in a triple quad design. So we'll start, what's the issue? The issue is here is in a single, in a normal ICPMS, you get all the ions coming in, you have a quadrupole, you separate them, only one mass of charge comes in. So in here, for example, we're looking at mass 52, we're seeing chromium and argon carbon. This two ions in here have got the same mass, 52, argon 40 and carbon 12. So you've got a false positive as a result. By going to a triple quad, you have a multiple in here that is used to do the reaction. Multiple has been there in triple quads for years. They, they have very good focusing, they're very good focusing device, and you needed that, especially for organic mass spectrometry where the ions have got very high energy. But in here, we're not trying to fragment ion, we're trying to react them. So you, the ions, you have lower energy, and you want to make sure that you've got enough time to do a, you know, the reaction. And that's what you're doing. That you're using a multiple as a reaction cell, not as a collision cell as such. And you get efficient reactions. So for example, here, if you put the ammonia, the ammonia reacts with the argon carbon, get rid of the charge on the argon carbon, and you form ammonium ion NH4+. The limitation of the multiple in here is that this NH4+, is going to remain in the multiple. It's not a mass filter. It's an ion guide. And as a, as a result, it's going to react with other things in the cell. In this example here, it will react with also ammonia, and it form ammonium species. And one of them, as you can see in here, NH4, NH3, 2 plus, guess what? That's mass 52. So you, you got rid of one interference, but you introduced another interference. And this is the spectrum. You can show it in here. If you're running the cell in a multiple mode, you will see a big NH4 that forms from the first reaction. And then the side reaction forming. So you got another here, NH4, NH3 plus and then a smaller one here, NH4, NH3, uh, 2 plus. So yes, it's smaller interference, but still it's an interference. And especially when you're looking at really low level in a high carbon matrix, you're bound to, you end up seeing false positives in that sense. How do we address that with a, a multiple system? In here, we're using a quadrupole and not a higher multiple system for this. And as we say, because the, IMB, the ions coming in are low energy, we're focusing them well, we're keeping them going through. And the advantage is here, when you get the reaction, when you get the first unwanted ions, the NH4+, plus, because this is a mass filter, you can eject it. You have a band pass on it that ejects lighter ions or heavier ions, depending on what you want, that's your application. In this case, you're just ejecting all the lighter ions that you are wanted un unwanted ions, you get rid of it and you have no side reaction taking place at all. So you can see the spectrum, no peaks, nothing at 14, nothing, and you really can see very, very small signal. This is the actual chromium impurities in the sample. So it's a great way to get the confidence and the accuracy of your result, that you're confident that when you're uh, doing reaction, your side reactions are not a pain that you have to worry about. You're gonna 
kick them out from the mass spectrometer as soon as they form. And then we talk about productivity, and that's switching between you know uh, different voltages, times if you want to extract or, or focus, and uh, changing the mode. You could see the response of the system is very, very fast. So you can you want to customize your operation to get the best detection limit for every element. You can do that without sacrificing your productivity. So here we're looking at changes on extraction mode. Here we're looking at changes in the gases. And so in the in the Nexium 5000, you have four up to four channel four gases that you can put or mix them together into the cell and that allows you to target specific interference so if you want the best for this metal and this uh, best for this element you and if they have if they need different gases you can still do that in the same method in the same run and the as the change from one gas to, to another is extremely fast as you can see in here so that's talking in general about the the uh, nexium 5000 uh, where would we benefit here? What's, what's the need of the nuclear industry for an ICPMS? Well, we've got a power plant, nuclear power plant, and you've got atmospheric emission of metals there. You need to monitor, and ICPMS is ideal for that. Investigating cleaner sources of energy, ICPMS will help. Nuclear enrichment for civilian or military application. Again, you can monitor the enrichment using ICPMS. And finally, if you want to monitor the environmental and human exposure to any nuclear byproduct, ICPMS is, is an ideal technique for doing this. And this is, I've taken a uh, liberty of uh, copying a, uh, a slide from a present, uh, publication from Dr. Becker on the general uh, radionuclide usage in, in analytical chemistry in here and divided between artificial and natural. So you can see you use it in, ge uh, in geochronology, uh, looking at the age of material, uh, of uh, the right of samples. We can use it in the semiconductor industry or general industry by looking for looking at uh, presence of these uh, uh, natural radionuclide in plant, in tissues, in uh, in water, in food, and or, or as impurities in semicon. Uh, when or with the when you move to artificial, you can use them for isotope dilution technique to get the most accurate results, especially if you look long lived uh, radionuclide. We can look at into uh, Health control, monitoring the exposure, whether from food, uh, looking at uh, energy active waste. On the other side, you can look at tracer experiments, study the fate of radionuclide in the environment. You can monitor the natural nuclear fallout and also do environmental monitoring. So it's a plethora of application that uh, ICPMS is very, very useful for in here. So, where does RCPMS uh, compare? to radiometric techniques. Typically, radiometric techniques are, are really ideal for very short-lived, uh, high-specific activity radionuclide. Uh, with ICPMS, it's a much faster technique, especially if you're looking at long-lived isotope. You don't need to count for six months. You can do the analysis in a couple of minutes. Additionally, uh, alpha spectrometry, as we know, cannot always distinguish between various transuranic uh, so here, this is a picture where we're talking concentration versus activity in, in, in vectoral uh, program. And uh, typically, you are talking in this region here where you flip between uh, ICP and radiometric detection. But as you can see, it will show today. Also, you can go all the way down to strontium-90. You can still now, with the increased sensitivity of the system, increased uh, background elimination of interference, you can push down. Uh, to, to to cesium and strontium detection. So starting with the plutonium, where's the issues of plutonium? It's a radioactive actinide. Um, you've got to use it for, for a, you know it's a, one of the three primary fissile isotopes. It's the two three nine. If we want to monitor it, and the issue with that, it's two three nine is very close to two three eight, which is the uranium. Usually you have very high uranium in there, uh, so you end up with interference from the uranium tail. From the peak of the uranium, or from any uranium hydride forming in here. So, how we can overcome that this issue? And if we look here, this is a publication uh, looking at the uh, reaction of ions in with different gases. Uh, and it takes back to 2002, and you could see here clearly when we see 
a differentiator here is this big number there, you call it a smaller number, and a big differentiation in here between uh, the reactivity to CO2 uh, between uranium and uh, plutonium. So uranium re reacts very efficiently in here, and your, your tail will drop by six orders of magnitude. Uranium hydride it also reacts, but not as efficient, and you could lose about two orders of magnitude, but then uranium hydride itself is very small. So the fact that you drop it by two orders of magnitude is fantastic. Let's, you got rid of the interference pretty much. While for plutonium, it's reacting very slowly. You will see a dip in plutonium initially, but then as you increase the, the gas, and eliminate the other two, uh, you're, you're, in the, you're undergoing collisional focusing that boosts the response. So you don't see much of a drop in the, uh, in the plutonium response. And this is some work that we've done here also not on CO2, but on uh, uh, using nitrogen itself, a cell which works the same. And you can see that we're talking about the initial drop with some reactivity, but then by in increasing the gas flow, you're, you're focusing the ions in, in there better, you're getting better transmission. So although you've lost some half of the ions, you've got more transmission, so you, your signal remain almost the same. Well, here we can see the uranium drop significantly, and so does the uranium hydride. So where can we go? We can actually down, can measure to single digit millibecquerel per liter of uranium, of plutonium to create. Another uh, is Neptunium. Neptunium in, in here, the issue again is the similar, uh, the interference from 238 and, uh, and 236 hydride. This time you're on the other side of the uranium 238 uh, peak. The 236 is small, but you still have some 236 hydride and uranium uranium 238 is you catching the, the light mass tail of the, uh, of, the, of the beam. So if we look here, what we can do, first thing is, the improved abundance sensitivity in here becomes a, a big major player because you know the abundance sensitivity you have two quadrupole and the design of the quadrupole on the on the first quadrupole of the uh, Nexium 5000 give you up to 10 to the power minus eight abundance sensitivity. That means if you have 10 to the power minus eight signal uh, minus nine 10 to the power nine signal, the tail from here on 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 two three seven is going to be only 10 k. And if you consider there is another quadrupole behind that, that's going to bring it another seven order of magnitude, that's it. You've eliminated that problem. So the abundance sensitivity help us to get rid of the uranium issue. The uranium hydride reaction with O2 is extremely slow. So uranium hydride uh, to form UHO species, but not UHO2, while the neptunium react efficiently to, with neptunium O2, and we've got data, will jump completely out of the interference and allows you to measure neptunium free at, uh, at neptunium O2. Uh, strontium is another radioisotope uh, of interest. Uh, we, we used strontium-89 is in nuclear medicine uh, for, for, for cancer treatment and, and, uh, and it's, uh, yeah, it's easily used because of its uh, 50 days uh, uh, half-life. However, if you jump to, if we end up with strontium-90, where we have uh, 20, about 28 years half-life, that's a, a significant health risk if it gets into the human body or if it gets into the food or anything like that. So monitoring it is quite important. The issue when you're doing it with ICPMS, in addition to the fact that it is, you know, 28 is not a very long uh, life, you know, half-life in, in this aspect in here. So we are looking at really, really low level, uh, that uh, we can, you know, low concentration that we need to achieve with ICPMS to do that. And we have interferences from yttrium-89 and zirconium-90 uh, that could interfere with 89 and 90 here. So what's the way to, to, to address this? As you can see in here, uh, by adding oxygen into the cell, we can minimize this interference significantly. The uh, zirconium reacts so fast, you lose a, a six orders of magnitude in here of intensity rapidly. You, you got rid of the zirconium very quickly by adding the oxygen. Meanwhile, the yttrium signal pretty much stays the same. It's not, uh, the, the strontium signal, sorry, will stay the same. So you'll see very little uh, losses uh, in that sense. And the fact that we're having now a, a, quad, a quadrupole at the beginning in front of the cell, that means 
any other material in the in the samples, you know, germanium, iron that could have reacted with oxygen to form mass 90 are now eliminated in the first quadrupole. As we said, with the multi-quad, you're controlling what gets into the cell, and then you control what happens in the cell. So you're controlling what gets into the cell, only mass 90 comes in, you got rid of germanium, you got rid of iron. So these species do not form, do not because they, they would have reacted efficiently with oxygen had they been there. We got rid of them and, and only kept their zirconium 90 and strontium 90. The zirconium react away and we get rid of that. And where we can go down here, we, we are, you know, uh, a, a becquerel of uh, here of strontium will be equivalent to about uh, a few PPT, PPQs of uh, sensitivity. So we are approaching here the limit of what we can measure. It's down, you know, yeah. most application we're talking about part per trillion, but, you know, we're pushing it now part per quadrillion PPQ. And we're talking, yeah, you know, by counting to about, uh, you know, about 10, 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, you can push down to sub PPQ level in, uh, in ICPMS with the, with the next in 5,000. Other potential application that I'm not going to touch much upon, but uh, it, it is very po popular to use with ICPMS, is using uh, nitrous oxide to, to react with uh, aberytium or cesium, using oxygen for iodine. These are other uh, ions that uh, you can use the gases to separate them from interference. So here, americium and plutonium, you, you, you ship the plutonium to PO, but keep americium where it is. Cesium unreactive with N2O, but barium react to form barium oxide, so you get rid of it. And the same thing with the, with the iodine O2, your, the I, I plus is non-reactive, while the xenon disappears very quickly. To, sum it, to, to finish it with additional things is what we can add uh, to the instrument to help us to even get lower and lower level is to have an automated sample cleanup and pre-concentration uh, to enhance the performance. And this is a typical example of what we have in here, where we have an automation for matrix elimin elimination sensitivity enhancement, and you can use separate column with different chemistries to apply for depending on the problem that we are trying to fix. So if we look at the, uh, the automated cleanup that we have in here, for setup for, for thorium pre-concentration. Pre we have the column in here, pre-concentration uh, uh, column in there. And the, the, the valve in is just uh, used, one, to load the sample onto the column, and then to flush it out by changing uh, between nitric and hydrochloric as the, the, as the carrier, and then to regenerate the column between samples. This is a very simple design to, to, to do that. Uh, the, the column we use is true spec. And then uh, we could uh, have a more complex design for hedium in here, where you have double valves, uh, double columns, so you can clean up and retain and, and do that. And it's uh, it becomes a little bit more complicated, but allows you to achieve extremely low level in that sense. Uh, I will, I'm going to stop in here as, as you know, just gave you, I uh, hope I gave you a brief overview of the capabilities of the instrument and where are the application that we can use uh, this technique in. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions you have. For questions, um, please use the text box in the bottom right corner. Uh, and before we um, start collecting the questions, I want to take a brief moment to acknowledge Mike. Mandrisa, Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Government Scientific Sources. As we mentioned before, that is Perkin Elmer's partner for GSA, ECAT, and other U.S. government contracts. So assuming a low to mid IP elements and a high efficiency nebulizer, what is the sample utilization efficiency for this system? That is, what fraction of atoms do you detect compared to those atoms that you inject into the ICP? Um, it depends. So one, yeah, that's a good question, and the first assumption is is, is very important. Uh, uh, yeah, you're you still gonna, you know. So if you're losing using very high efficiency nebulizer, so you minimize because typically with normal nebulizer you're gonna lose about probably fifty, uh, you know, fifty times. Uh, you know, so you you you're you're, you're 
you know, the number of ions that gets uh, the atoms that get to the plasma is, is probably only two to five percent. So you've got high efficiency, low flow. You you're approaching hundred percent. Your first uh, drop is going to be a, a factor of a hundred. You're going to be losing at the interface itself. So that's going to be uh, your, your your biggest drop. In, in all fairness, we haven't looked into depth into the calculation in there, but uh, the yeah, my estimation is you're probably going to be talking uh, one in a thousand or between one in a thousand, one in ten thousand. So you lose a hundred times. Uh, definitely at the interface, that's uh, that will happen with the explosion of the ion beam. We regain quite a bit. We we keep it focused beyond the skimmer, but there is a, probably another ten times to hundred times. So yeah, one in a thousand, one to ten thousand, probably in there. We have not done the calculation, but it's a very interesting question and something that definitely will be worth uh, pursuing to, to to check on that. Super, thank you. The next question: What is the abundance sensitivity of the instrument when running tandem mass spec mode? uh it's beyond what you can measure in reality uh, is if we look at each uh, mass spectrometer in its own uh it's about 10 to power minus 8 10 to power minus 7 10 to power minus 8 so so if we if theoretically you're up to 10 to power minus 15 something like that so theoretically but uh you know it's yeah it's beyond what you can measure in reality in reality because you know you're uh uh, detector has got 10 to power minus uh, 10 to power 11 detect uh, range, so it's beyond the range of the detector. It's, it's Super. Fun. The next question: What gases are supported? Uh, we are supporting almost any gases. Uh, so the design of the instrument is uh, uh, to 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 is uh, to able to, to to handle very highly reactive gases so we have ammonia the pumps are all designed uh, to, with self purge to to prevent any of these reactive gases to attack the, uh, the pump themselves so uh, typically you will get uh, the gases that people use uh, is uh, are uh, you know most popular one will be ammonia uh, oxygen uh, nitrogen or uh, methane Hydrogen. Uh, these are the uh, the typical what they use. You could use helium if you want to do collision, not reaction. Uh, you could use argon for some collision strike re reaction. And we've done some more reactive like uh, ammonium fluoride, uh, not ammonium fluoride, uh, methyl fluoride, and we've done something like that also on, on this system. But, uh, so yeah, uh, it's designed to handle even the most reactive of gases at this at this stage. Thank you. Um, what is the maximum count rate on the EM? It's well, around 10 to the 10. It's 10 to the 10 on, 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 uh, it's not any, it's a, it's a, uh, it's not a, a it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a 10 to the 10, but with the system, allowing you to we have the edr you mentioned it that we devised it that it's within our detect within our cell itself so you can extend our detection to 10 to 12 10 to 13 something like that super what is the max mass range on the different quads um 285 I believe it's I two five two eight five two eight six. So I'm yeah, something along that line. Okay. The next question is: Do we need to get special permission to analyze radionuclides by the Nexion five thousand, or default the features available with the Nexion five thousand? Um, it depends on the uh, where in the world. Obviously, you need special license to be able to use a uh, the mass spec for for nuclear applications. So, uh, yeah, in the U.S., you don't need it. But depending on which part of the world, then you'll need the the license to do that. Uh, and then uh, you actually the the biggest precaution that you need to do is is uh, how you're going to handle your sample and all of that. So it depends how hot are these radioactive samples. If they're not uh hot enough to, to affect you know to, for you to put it in a glove box or something like that you can run them normally and if you 
if they are hot, uh, you need a glove box, then you need to uh, to get a glove box installed in front of the instrument. We're working on a, on a such a project already uh, for a couple of companies in France. We are we developing that. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, it, it depends. But in general, you could use it normally. Uh, you need to take the precaution that you've got the oil in the pump that. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's going to become radioactive, and you need to, uh, to handle that. But on the instrument itself, there uh, should be no no issues. Safety precautions for the user during the analysis of the radioisotopes by ICPMS. Definitely, you need to take uh, a lot of safety precautions. There, as I mentioned it earlier, it depends on the radioactivities and the activity of the what you're measuring. Uh, so and. Yeah, you know, it depends also on the site that way you are. I'm picking up a lot of noise on the line. I don't know whether people are doing that same. So it's really, I would say, it's uh, more related to the health and safety uh, of the site itself uh, in terms of the, the health precaution. So it will depend on the policy of the site and the what the health and safety officer in the site wish to implement, but definitely you'll need to take that into consideration. Thank you. What are the LODs on radium? Well, uh, it depends whether you're doing it with uh, with the uh, enrich with the enrichment and or not. But in a standard one, it's a uh, it's close to uh, part you know single part per quadrillion, single part per quadrillion. One question is, could you please provide the Santos reference again? Yeah, it's Journal of Physical Chemistry, uh, A, 2002, uh, issue 100 and 106, uh, 31, and pages 7190 to 7194. Thank you. What is the minimum sample volume needed for radionuclide analysis? It depends on the level you're trying to measure in in that sense and uh, and yeah and, and the the level you're trying to measure so it depends on the nuclide and the and the and the level you're trying to measure uh, you could have very low flow nebulizers down to 20 microliters per minute and uh, and then you'll need to uh we need to figure out basically the uh, uh how long you're going to be the counting so again it depends on the element, depend on the level we're trying to measure, and that we establish that one. But yeah, you go down to 20 microliters per minute. So if you're counting for, say, even if you go for 30, you know, 10 minutes, that would be uh, 200 microliters, something like that. But uh, it depends. Thank you. Please discuss the use of the echrome resin for a synthetized separation in the pre-concentrator of the FAST system. That's, uh, yeah, that's the uh, echrome is, is one of the uh, typical example that you could use in here. So what you have, you'll have the two carrier, depending on the element that you want to be using. Uh, yeah, and you can, so you load your sample on the, you know, one of them, one of the solution, you use to, and you can have more pumps, by the way. So if you need more, you can have up to three. So you one will be used to regenerate the column, uh, one to to precondition it, and uh, to so you can load the sample on it, and capture the sample, and one flow will be to flush out uh, the material, the column. So it depends on the elements you're using and the column itself, but uh, yeah. Uh, please discuss the effects of high activity isotope entrance to the triple quad on the dionide detector contamination. Uh, by, by the time you're getting in there, yes, if you've got uh, if, if you've got deposit of some uh, of this radionuclide inside the instrument, it, it's going to be verified by the time you're getting in there. But you, you you will get that, and you'll that get continuous emission on the detector. So slowly. Uh, you will start seeing an elevated baseline. Your background noise of the detector will will get elevated. Uh, initially, it shouldn't would not affect your detection limit because it's going to be constant. However, as you go higher and higher, then that becomes an issue. Uh, 
the detector will end up having to be disposed of it. So it depends on the radioactivity level you're measuring and what you're doing in there. You probably to change the detector anytime between one year and five years, depending on the application. But yeah, the detector is a consumable in, in that aspect and you'll end up having to replace it. Thank you. Um, next question. There are multiple sources in the literature that state that tritium reacts with oxygen to form the monoxide species. But you stated in the slides that this reaction doesn't proceed. Is there something different about the analysis that prevents this reaction from occurring? What is the pressure of the O2 used approximately? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting. It's a lot of the usage of uh, the formation of SRO in with gases is typically done with the, I believe it's NO, not O2. Uh, there is actually a very good uh, JTL uh, publication that goes through all these ions and describes the reactivity uh, with the various gases. So, uh, and then I would recommend, uh, it's, uh, it's a publication by Anisic, Aninic uh, at the JTL and uh, you know, so typically when you're forming SRO, it's, it's, it's using NO and uh, OCO, but not O2. That's that's what we've seen. The next question re uh, relates to the ECRON resin and the precursor. Um, they're asking you the uses of the ECRON resin precursor for uranium stripping to isolate plutonium acid, uh, isotope 239 and 240 for isotopic ratio analysis. Yes, that will be a, uh, you know, as we showed in here, you can get rid of the uranium interference efficiently uh, with the system. So it depends on on the magnitude of what you try, how low you want to you know kill it completely um, to do that. The icron will will work if you want to separate the uranium that way. Well, that will give you an additional bonus. So. Uh, and you could do it that way to do the plutonium and the uh, plutonium ratio between the two isotopes. But uh, I would say, give it, you know, first I would try it with just the, the normal gases in the cell and and, and get rid of the uranium uh, itself because it's a very, very efficient. Um, but uh, yeah, using the ICROM is, is, is a very good way. And the, the setup can be fully automated in here. So we can have it set up, you know, we have all of that. Uh, all the gear available uh, with the instrument, so it can be fully automated. Thank you. Um, one question has come around. Can you highlight the major differences between this new uh, Nexion 5000 and the Agilent AV900? Yeah, I think the, the biggest difference is, uh, is the 8900, that I would say two big differences. One, the 8900 does have a, uh, a lens system behind the, uh, the cones, so as a result, you're gonna have to clean those lenses more frequently. So that's one uh, one side of the uh, of the coin. The other one is that uh, it uses a multipole, as we're showing in here. The Azure uses uh, a multipole system, so you've got uh, no control of side reactions. So although you with the Azure, you you control what gets into the cell, which what you will do with any uh real triple quad so the action is a real triple quad so so you get that and you control it get into the cell the issue with it is because it's a multiple you cannot control the reaction in the cell so the only control you have over the reaction is by starving it from other content by controlling what goes in but you know like as example in here you're not going to stop ammonia being ammonia being there because you're adding it as the gas so you end up with byproduct, and sometimes you can end up so some impurities in the gas, and so that impurities get reacted. So so you have more confidence in the efficiency of your reaction and the the quality of your result uh, with our system because, as I say, you can get rid of that reaction because you have a quadrupole here. You eject the byproduct as soon as they form. Thank you. Um, the next question is, can you control the kinetic energy of the ions entering the reaction cell? Yes, you can. So you you, you, you can adjust the uh, rod offsets in here to, to control the, 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 the ions coming in. Yeah, definitely. And then there's a question on, what is the energy range for the ions entering the collision cell? 
how much it's can this be triggered? Then they're asking also, can you tinker with it to affect the reactivities? Yes, it's a few electron volts, but yes, you can tinker with it. Fantastic. I think we've answered all the questions we've had, which has been super. I have, um, if I have one question. More, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yep. them. Yeah. I can hear okay. you. Yeah, I have uh, one question, Patty, and that is, uh, can you uh, change what you want to see based on the quadrupoles? Can I use a single quadrupole, a triple quadrupole at times? Could I multipole and use that in a method? I didn't get the question here, though. <laughs> what do you mean changing what you want to so, see? So if I wanted to uh, uh, create a certain method, a single quadrupole uh, for some elements, a triple quadrupole for others? Oh, yeah, yeah. So you want to use you run on the same method. Uh, you can use it using only Q1 and set the cell and uh, Q theta's transmission. So you're using it as a single quad, or you could do it Q1 as transmission, cell empty, Q3 uh, as an analyzer, you use it Q3. You can use them both in tandem. Uh, yeah, you can use it in any mode you want. Okay, great, thank you. Great, we'll that give answers. another minute or two. Oh, any other questions? If not, I want to thank uh, uh, Fadi and Dr. Uh, uh, Bushrakra for his uh, fantastic uh, presentation, the super information he's given to everyone. I want to thank all the attendees for joining us for this uh, webinar. And uh, feel free, if you have any questions, to email us directly. And we look forward to engaging with you again in the near future. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.